You have the unique background of having dropped out of high school and dropped out of university. Can you explain what went through your mind dropping out of high school? Well, I didn't technically speaking drop out, although I sort of practically speaking did. Um, uh, but uh, you know, g- given my lack of education credentials elsewhere, I, I, I do. Um, uh, I should, for the sake of my parents, um, uh, insist that I do, in fact, uh, or did, in fact, formally speaking, graduate from high school. But um, I, I guess what happened is that uh, I'd become very interested in programming, and I sort of wanted to spend as much time on it as possible. And Ireland actually has this kind of interesting thing called transition year, uh, this year between the sort of two major uh, exams uh, of, of kind of high school, or at least Ireland's high school equivalent, uh, and in transition year, it's, it's sort of a it's a formally designated year that's optional, where you can go and pursue things that you might not otherwise you know, naturally tend to pursue. And the school tends to be kind of much more permissive of going and spending three months abroad, or going and doing some work experience in this area, or you know whatever the case might be. And so in that year, I basically decided to spend as much of it as possible programming. And so you know I did that. And then I returned to school uh, for kind of the you know latter half um, of, of uh, again Ireland's kind of uh, high school system, and it felt so much slower and less fun. Uh, and so I tried to see if, um, well, as part of the programming, I had v- visited the U.S. for the first time. Um, I had gone to Stanford for the 2005 International Lisp Conference, um, and there it was, it was a fairly small conference uh, and. Uh, but but it, was, it was very eye, eye-opening for me. Uh, and I remember, you know, walking around Stanford and thinking, man, American colleges seem great. Uh, and so I, uh, you know, back in high school in Ireland, I, I decided to see if there was some way that I could just go to college in the U.S. the subsequent year. And it was sort of a long story, but I eventually figured out that I could not do it if I did the standard Irish kind of um follow the standard Irish education path, but that I could do it if I did the British um, sort of terminal uh, examination. And so I kind of resumed my uh, sort of self-education, except instead of programming, I was now studying for these you know, British exams uh, and did that for the subsequent year and uh, ended up starting at MIT the next fall. And how do we get from MIT to where we are today, which is Stripe's offices in San Francisco? Well, it's sort of a long and torturous story, uh, and I'll spare you most of the... Um, less interesting details. Um, I guess the overarching thing is while people in the U.S. have sort of grown up in an environment in which college attendance is sort of really prioritized from an early age and sort of, you know, you're optimizing your extracurricular activities from the time you're 14 and you're choosing your kindergarten on the basis of what the sort of downstream college acceptance rates look like and all that kind of stuff. Um, Of course, growing up in Ireland, that sort of wasn't part of the, you know, culture or discourse or environment at all. And and so by the time I got to MIT and just to college in general, um, it, it didn't feel like that big a deal. It, it didn't feel like um, sort of this was the terminal state that I'd sort of spent my entire uh, kind of childhood and adolescence sort of trying to pursue. And so as a kind of other things and other ideas uh, and opportunities sort of, you know, cross the transom, I, I think I was maybe more open to them uh, than uh, than my peers, not because of, I think, any differences in me, but just because of differences in the cultural environment that I'd come from. Uh, and so my brother John and I, John at this point uh, being a little bit younger, he was now in this transition here in Ireland. We decided to start a company um, six months after I got to MIT. Uh, and so I, I'd really just started, and I felt that I had some kind of time to spare because I'd started college a year younger than you know, most of my peers. Uh, And that company sort of worked okay, and uh, it's kind of um, a long story, but it ended up becoming a a small acquisition. I went back to MIT because when I'd started there, I'd sort of uh, been very interested in math and physics and had kind of been interested in this idea of potentially becoming, or at least attempting to become some kind of academic. And of course, at a place like MIT, that's sort of the default around you. You Everyone is planning on at least, again, trying to get a PhD or to become a professor or whatever. And so I think, you know, that, that environment had some effect on me. And so I went back um, because I felt that I hadn't sort of uh, really, you know, properly rejected the hypothesis that maybe I should try to become a professor, right? Maybe, maybe kind of physics is is what I should be, um, again, uh, at least attempting to, to spend my career on. Um, and after a year back at MIT, I decided that that, that, that was not the case. Um, progress in physics really felt like it had sort of sl- slowed down pretty substantially, 
compared to the you know 1910s, 20s, 30s, the, the sort of the period in which so much of what you know, we were learning about um, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of broader period of discovery, um, I felt like the period in which uh, sort of you know we existed in say 2010 was, was there really was just not the same rate of progress, and so there was a, a little bit of that, and then also some amount of sort of appreciation myself that uh, I think I just enjoyed programming and software and technology more than I did math and physics, uh, even though to some degree it was a little bit uh, maybe painful to, to realize that. I want to explore a little more about the cultural differences between Ireland and the U.S. and how that impacts you as the, hmm. the CEO of Stripe. I think there's maybe a couple of things in that um, Ireland is very outward looking, necessarily so, in that sort of Ireland's sort of improbable rise from poverty over the latter half of the 20th century was very significantly enabled, maybe almost wholly enabled by uh, by exports, by <laughs> sort of importing American multinational companies, uh, having them set up factories and bases and, and you know hubs of different sorts in Ireland. Uh, one of the world's first special economic zones was created in Shannon, uh, which was you know, very close to you know, maybe 10, 15 miles from where I was born. Deng Xiaoping visited it uh, and found this quite inspiring and so decided to set up, set up uh, special economic zones in China. And so Shenzhen and, and the sort of um, the Pearl River Delta, that, that sort of uh, special economic zone was in, in, in some ways directly inspired by you know, what he saw in Western Ireland. And, and so I think the fact that sort of uh, there, there's such a, a very visceral link between kind of betterment and progress and economic development and this kind of outward looking uh, sense that the possibilities uh, of the of the rest of the world are sort of much greater than than kind of those internally um, uh, you know that, that that's very pervasive in Ireland um, and I think that's certainly influenced stripe in the sense that you know we really are always trying to emphasize the sort of the imperative for and the you know, potential of globalization. Uh, and while maybe in the mid-90s that was sort of something that was uniformly accepted in sort of um, at least elite circles, uh, now obviously that's something that perhaps has been questioned somewhat more, but I guess the Irish experience is very much uh, one of seeing it as an almost wholly unalloyed good. Uh, and, and again, I think that's that's greatly influenced us here, certainly me. Um, well, it's interesting too from a cultural standpoint where Ireland has had very high rates of immigration, um, particularly post the expansion of the EU in 2004, uh, a, a very large number of Eastern uh, European uh, uh, immigrants moved to Ireland uh, when those countries uh, acceded to, to the EU. And that was really not accompanied by any any material social strife or conflict or uh, a lot of the sort of um, challenges that we've seen in sort of other parts of the world. And so again, I think that sort of an appreciation for borders that are more open or more openness to immigrants, um, uh, more sort of facilitation of opportunity, things like that. Again, I think that that really is the Irish experience. Um, and of course, there's the reverse version where so many Irish people themselves uh, have sort of benefited enormously from being able to go and sort of you know, pursue lives in the UK and Australia and the US and Canada uh, and so on. And that's, again, just really kind of part of the national ethos. And then maybe more softly, I guess, Irish culture places um, places a lot of importance on uh, just a kind of warmth uh, and there's the kind of a particular a particular tenor to the sort of interpersonal dynamics and trying to have other people enjoy themselves and be at ease and have a good conversation with them and whatever else. Uh, and I think maybe that's something that's influenced us somewhat at Stripe, where we, we want Stripe to be a a warm place. Uh, I mean, we we play music at reception and in the kitchen to just try to put people at ease and to create enough sort of um, soft noise around them where they feel comfortable having just a good conversation. Uh, and you know, m maybe that's because of entirely unrelated reasons, or, or maybe again, in some way we're influenced by the, the, the kind of environment we grew up in in Ireland. 
How would you describe the culture at Stripe? What do you actively try to achieve with that? Well, I'll answer that with a caveat. Uh, and the caveat is that I'm pretty sure the answer I would have given to this would have differed in some material ways uh, two or three years ago, right? Uh, and that's in part because I think we're coming to realize things that we just hadn't really appreciated or sort of seen the significance of two or three years ago. And also in part because uh, literally what it is that we need today is just different to what we needed two or three years ago, right? And so I think there's kind of double contingency in the answer where it's a function of just what we've realized at this point, but also sort of what it is that the organization and the company needs uh, given the sort of challenges that we currently face. With that caveat, I think the things that we really prize and uh, try to you know, seek in the people we hire are um, a kind of rigor and clarity of thought uh, in that I think so many organizations prize uh, sort of smoothness and smoothness of sort of interactions and uh, trying to reduce, minimize the number of sort of ruffled feathers. Uh, and, and they kind of at least sort of inadvertently, if not deliberately, prefer cohesion over correctness. Uh, and we really try to uh, identify people who who are seeking correctness and who don't mind being wrong and who are willing to at least contemplate things that seem improbable or surprising if true or really divergent to what is sort of the generally accepted status quo. Um, and, and that's hard to find. Uh, and I don't think most of the sort of educational institutions that we all tend to have attended actually do a great job of, of teaching that. Uh, and so we look for that kind of combination of sort of openness and rigor. Um, I don't exactly know what the right word is, but uh, a kind of determination and competitiveness and, I guess, willfulness uh, in that just doing anything of significance is hard. <laughs> uh, I mean, anyone who's tried to do um, anything that sort of they, they themselves consider significant knows that very viscerally, right? Uh, and I mean, especially for a startup, like the, the default outcome is your relatively near-term non-existence. Like the, the default outcome is that you do not survive. Um, to, to survive over the medium or you know, even with even more difficulty over the long term, um, that is, that, that's like an unnatural act, right? And so you need to find people who not just are willing to sort of push against the uh, sort of the expected trajectory uh, of non-existence, but people who actually enjoy that, who want that, right? Uh, because if they're merely willing to do it, but they don't actually enjoy it, then you know, the, the, the work is probably going to be less fulfilling for them over the, uh, over the medium term. Um, and I really don't think that is for everyone. I don't think that's that's a bad thing, right? In that, just the, the, the cliche, of course, is that startups are extraordinarily hard, and 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 they just are. Uh, and you you want somebody who finds that who's at a stage in their life where that's the kind of challenge that they want, uh, where the fact that the particular area in which they're going to be working is sort of undefined or significantly underbuilt out or significantly broken or whatever the case might be, that that's what they're looking for, right? And then we try to find people who just have a kind of, again, to return to this word, interpersonal warmth uh, and a desire to make others around them better and, uh, and just a degree of caring for others and a desire to be I mean, nice is a kind of anodyne word, <laughs> but to be nice to them, um, to, to, to make them better off, right? Uh, we we tr really try to find people who we just actively enjoy spending time with, right? You spend such a large fraction of your life inside you know, the, the walls and under the roof of you know, whatever organization, institution you're working at. Uh, and so given that, I really think it's worth prioritizing this and I... I think, I mean, I of course don't know for sure, but I think we go to sort of some greater lengths to find these people uh, than than other organizations tend to do. Um, and and there's, you know, there's other things as well. I mean, you know, 
it almost goes without saying, but we really care a great deal about ethics and integrity in people. But you know, I think so, so too do a lot of other organizations. I, I think the the three that kind of really stand out to me are this kind of rigor and clarity of thought, this sort of hunger, appetite, willfulness, determination, um, and this again warmth and desire to make people uh, uh, around them better off. Th those are three that really stand out to me. Take me back to the early days of Stripe and the struggles you were having and maybe sure. walk me through some of the things that you've learned uh, since then or th some of the mistakes that you had made. Sure. I mean, the kind of background context here is that by almost every sort of, uh, under almost every kind of ostensibly sane analysis, Stripe looked like a bad idea, right? Um, this was a crowded market. There were tons of existing incumbents. There were significant regulatory and just kind of partnership institutional barriers to entry. Um, we had no experience in the domain. We were very young. Uh, we we weren't even U.S. citizens in you know, a, an ecosystem uh, that... Again, just because of the regulatory dynamics, you know, that sort of adds further complication. We had no sort of obvious mechanism for gaining sort of significant distribution, uh, and we were not a sort of naturally viral product or you know one that would have sort of organic adoption the way maybe a social network or a consumer product might have. And so, for all those reasons, I think a lot of people sort of very reasonably thought that either Stripe was a bad idea or uh, you know <laughs> us pursuing Stripe. Uh, w w was a bad idea, and they certainly didn't hesitate to tell us that. And you know, uh, to be clear, I, th I think they were I think they were doing something reasonable by telling us that. I mean, they were giving us their sort of honest and again, you know, reasonably justified assessment. And so it all started sort of in the background context of that. I think the thing that primarily gave us the confidence to actually attempt it was it just seemed so strange that something with Stripe's character didn't exist. Uh, in that we really looked for Stripe before we. Uh, before we started it, as in it just it felt that it must be the case that there is some service, some company somewhere offering infrastructure and APIs and payments and economic tools that are straightforward to use for a developer. Right? I mean, this is one of the sort of top needs that any business operating on the internet has. Arguably, by definition, sort of a business on the internet uh, must have access to these tools. Uh, there are tens of millions of, of developers operating on the internet. And so just g given the magnitude of that market and the sort of obviousness of the business model, it really felt like this had to exist. And so we'd kind of forlornly Google for it, you know, with different sort of permutations of keywords. And then sort of after a couple of months became, you know, somewhat resigned to the fact that no, it did not in fact, you know, improbably exist. And, um, and, and its non-existence was so kind of strange to us that that, that actually initially kind of discouraged us where if there was sort of such an obvious idea and such a surprising you know absence of a, of a kind of solution maybe there's some kind of latent force that we're not seeing that actually makes sort of solving it impossible right in that you know for example uh, we were also interested at the same time in uh, why kind of consumer banks were so bad uh, in that just you know they weren't really keeping abreast of technology and the fees were really high and they were getting fined by the CFPB and you know, et cetera et cetera et cetera and uh, and as we looked into it, it became apparent that actually there was a good reason as to why the problem had not been solved, where A, the banks are subject to sort of such onerous regulation where it's very difficult for them to do anything themselves, right? And so, for example, the difference between a checking account and a savings account, which might seem sort of quite unfriendly from a consumer standpoint, that's actually kind of essentially mandated by law. And so it's kind of not on some level the bank's fault. And the second reason is uh, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, which is the entity that uh, sort of issues federal banking charters uh, had, had basically stopped issuing new banking charters post financial crisis. And so if you came along and you're like, well, I'm going to go solve all these problems in consumer banking, uh, you're essentially blocked from doing so by the kind of regulatory apparatus. Uh, and so we kind of wondered in this kind of similar vein, is there some force like that, not necessarily regulatory, but just like if there's some constraint that, that kind of we aren't observing or weren't. Um, and after maybe you know, a couple months of investigation, we decided that no, there didn't appear to be at least. I mean, of course, you can never kind of definitively reject it, but we, we really couldn't find one. And so we decided to build a prototype. And uh, the prototype was kind of built uh, sort of uh, on top of and with sort of um, uh, existing payment systems. And so it, it didn't do anything uh, kind of overly ambitious. It was just sort of enough to kind of get a sense for what... It was more like a... Um, 
it was almost like a sort of concept rendering of what a, a solution could look like rather than a, sort of a, a solution itself. But it was sufficient to get just a couple of our friends uh, started using it. And I think the particular thing we realized that caused us to you know, really go take it a little bit more seriously and, I mean, concretely to drop out of college was the realization that the sort of problem that we perceived in kind of developers like us, people building some little side project or with this kind of very nascent um, uh, you know, startup or something like that, that the problems we perceived for kind of that segment of the market were actually the problems that larger companies had as well. That kind of what we thought initially might be a little lake of opportunity was sort of more akin to an ocean. And when we talked to companies doing hundreds of millions or billions uh, in revenue or companies in other countries and so on, and we just asked them to kind of recount their problems and what they wished existed and everything else, they basically give us the same roster of features. Um, and when we thought about it and just like looked at the kind of macro figures, we saw that, you know, about at the time, 2% of all consumer spending in the world happened on the internet. And, and so even though we were kind of, you know, 20 years into sort of the web's evolution, and even though, you know, we'd all engage in lots of e-commerce and so on, when, when you looked at it sort of on a, on a macro basis, it was apparent that, you know, we were still kind of barely off the starting blocks. Uh, and so I think the combination of those things where we kind of decided that there didn't appear to be some sort of um, some dark energy preventing a solution uh, and that this, the set of problems we could see actually seemed sort of very pervasive rather than just sort of a microcosm. And, uh, and then thirdly, that actually this whole market and environment was, was still actually at a sort of surprisingly nascent stage when you looked at sort of the full picture, uh, then we decided to drop out. You guys went from two employees, you and your brother as co-founders, to 800, 900 now? Uh, we're about 1,000 now. 1,000 employees. Yeah. What have you learned from scaling the business? I think on some level, scaling a business is both relatively straightforward and extremely hard. I mean, it's relatively straightforward in the sense that it's usually not that difficult to see what the problems are. Um, and to the extent that you don't see what the problems are, it's usually because there's some kind of uh, subjective blindness rather than it being actually difficult to see the problem, right? And so it's more sort of a question of what are you oblivious to because of your own biases rather than what is particularly difficult to observe and kind of what are your corrective mechanisms um, to, to sort of account for that. So it's, I think, straightforward in that sense. Um, and I guess straightforward in the sense that usually solving the problems is not outlandishly difficult. Um, I mean, it, it's not easy, but you need to hire someone in this role. You need to figure out how to raise this capital. You need to build this system, whatever the case might be. I mean, th none of those are easy things, but they're also not sort of you know, scientific breakthroughs. Uh, there are other companies that have done it. Uh, there are generally playbooks that exist. Uh, and while sort of your particular strategy might need some sort of correction, refinement, and you might hit some walls along the way, um, it's it's rarely unprecedented. And then I think it's extremely difficult in the sense that you're <laughs> you don't get to really choose the clock cycle uh, kind of and, and the time horizons. Um, there's a category of uh, sort of flash games, um, desktop tower defense games, uh, where you're sort of you know, building little towers that shoot missiles, and you have all these little critters uh, sort of scampering uh, across the board, uh, trying to sort of you know, break into your fortress or whatever the case might be. And uh, a startup feels a little bit like that, where you fundamentally don't control the sort of <laughs> the rate of you know, problem appearance. <laughs> um, uh, you, you just control the uh, sort of the other variable of uh, the rate at which you're you know, building defensive or mitigatory or I don't know, um, mechanisms to, to to deal with those problems. And sometimes the rate of the problem creation can outstrip uh, the rate at which you can solve them, even though in principle any one of them uh, is, uh, is, is relatively manageable, right? Uh, and so I think that really adds a lot of difficulty. I, I think just on a, even if in, on this kind of very abstract level, uh, dealing with the problems is uh, you know, tractable. Um, the, the character of 
having problems materialize at sort of at every level uh, of of the organization or at every kind of level of abstraction or you know at every kind of magnitude and and so on that's just a kind of unnatural thing that i think is just on, on a on a psychological emotional level difficult to deal with and so while you might recognize sort of on some contemplative stoic level that this is how it goes um you know that's not necessarily how it feels in the moment right and it kind of feels like that way every day and some days you almost have to smile at the sort of unreasonableness of the swathe of problems and challenges uh, that have met you know, uh, materialized on your desk or in your inbox, and uh, in that you know it, 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 it sort of it, in the same way that you see the constellations in the stars. You know, the sort of constellation of the problems looks so implausible and so unreasonable that like someone must secretly be screwing with you, right? Um, and so there's that kind of emotional sort of self management, and then of course th there's the challenges of dealing with uncertainty, uh, where you know it's I mean it's it's kind of uh, I guess um, well. You're operating in sort of the weird zone where you're often making decisions that have sort of significant long-term impact um, or that are at least difficult to reverse or, or to course correct um, in the face of great uncertainty, right? And the uncertainty is often unnecessary in the sense that uh, you could, in principle, go and, and significantly reduce the uncertainty. You could go and study the question more. You could go and obtain more information. You could go and run an experiment. You know, it, it's not like cosmic uncertainty where there's just, it, it's true sort of nice and unknowability. And I think when, when it is like true, deep, unmitigatable uncertainty, then I think it's not too hard to say, well, we're just going to choose something and, you know, make the best decision we can. I think it's a more frustrating kind of uncertainty where it's actually not necessary, but the thing that's sort of limited is your is essentially the cost of obtaining further information, reducing that uncertainty. Um, and so you're left in this sort of dissatisfying situation where I have to make a highly consequential decision. There's a lot of uncertainty. We could have less uncertainty. We could take steps to mitigate that, but we just don't have time to. Uh, and making a lot of decisions in that zone is, is somewhat dissatisfying, right? And I think kind of correctly so, and that you know, you, one is correctly reacting to the fact that it could be otherwise, right? And then lastly, maybe you're playing this sort of um, multi-armed bandit problem where you're sort of constantly trying to balance exploration and exploitation or sort of you know, just optimization of that which already exi exists and sort of doing it better and better um, with trying to figure out what are the things that you know, we aren't doing or that we don't know or we haven't even considered or you know, if we were doing would make this other part of the organization sort of vastly more effective and so on. Sort of, it's very hard to know what the optimal rate of exploring those things is while also basically operating outside the system and operating inside the system or optimizing outside the system and optimizing it, uh, inside the system. <clears throat> and it's very hard to know what the right kind of rate of doing those things is. Uh, and so, again, I think a lot of the challenge of, of, um, of scaling the organization is sort of finding at, at each kind of moment the, the right way to balance those things. Um, but without ever having kind of sat down before to try to sort of, you know, in any way to kind of distill it into any um, unified theory, I think that a lot of the experience of scaling an organization is kind of specific versions uh, or specific applications of sort of of those dynamics uh, and just figuring out how you yourself or how the organization or how your peers and colleagues um, sort of deal with that and what the kind of structural mechanisms for, for doing so is or are. Um, and then maybe very lastly, I mean, those, those, those are all kind of the, the structural ones. Um, I think there's just also a, um, a personal version where you certainly don't start out being well adapted to, or at least in my case, particularly skilled in organizational management and leadership. And I mean, depending on the rate of growth of the company, you sort of need to acquire those skills on, uh, on again, a, <laughs> on, a, on a timeline that's largely out of your control. Um, and you know, depending on the rate of the rate of growth of the organization, you know, that might be a pretty difficult thing. Uh, and so, you know, certainly in my case, I think I've just had to you know, accept my sort of managerial inadequacy relative to what either 
is required in the moment or sort of will in the you know, near term impending future be required uh, and just figure out strategies to try to acquire those skills and abilities as rapidly as possible. Back to the explore exploit kind of comment that you made, which we can probably just relate to focus. How do you think about focusing on one thing and being exceptional at that or doing a variety of things and trying to be exceptional at all of them? You mean in the organization or personally? Oh, in the organization and maybe personally, if that's different. I, I don't know of a better answer other than using course heuristics and then being willing to revisit or make an exception if uh, if something seems sort of particularly promising, right? Uh, you know, roughly speaking, we invest most of our effort, we don't have a precise number on it, but let's just say 70 or 80 percent in optimizing that which we already have, that which we already know is producing returns, that which there's a sort of relatively clear line of sight from sort of the input, the work, the optimization, whatever, to sort of the uh, output improvement, and then, you know, some fraction of the work and the sort of a distribution of um, of bet skew, but uh, some fraction of the work, let's call it 20%, um, uh, into things that are more speculative, right? And I think that's kind of necessarily the case because uh, well, I, I think it's necessarily the case that, call it again, 70 or 80% is devoted towards optimization of that which already exists. If we did not do that, you know, in the, again, we, we, if we did not do that, that, then this kind of default non-existence we just discussed would be guaranteed, right? Um, uh, it's very easy to sort of fly the company into the side of a hill. Um, and so I think really the question is just, do you spend 20% of your time on things that are more speculative or do you, uh, or, or do you spend 0%? And then maybe secondly, to what degree do you allow those answers to be different at different levels and of the company and in sort of in different places and kind of how much is it sort of a, a, a uniform answer and how much heterogeneity do you permit, um, or do you design for, um, and I think as we've grown, we've we've tried to shift into a model where it is somewhat less uniform, and in certain teams, less optimization of what already exists is going to be required. It's going to require more exploration, uh, and in other parts of the company, uh, it'll be tilted in the reverse direction. And I think that's a sort of that kind of um, recursive decomposition. I, I, I think is uh, is really required to avoid the diseconomies of scale that otherwise set in as you grow. How do you decide which speculative projects you take on? Are they based on disrupting your business or these are things that I, I want to do or I want Stripe to do or? I don't know that there's a better answer beyond given all of the axes of you know, constraints and returns, which ones seem like a like a good idea. And I mean, I, th I think it's kind of like investing when you ask, you know, wh wh what's the, uh, what are the criteria for investing in a company? It's, well, when you kind of <laughs> normalize down from the sort of, you know, really high dimensional space of market and founders and idea and, you know, all these things, when you normalize all that down into kind of what do you think the return profile looks like? Well, you invest when the return profile looks good enough, right? Uh, and I think kind of similarly, when you decide, you know, which ideas to pursue, of course, on each axis, there are many things you prefer or you, you know, don't want or, or whatever. And, you know, for example, something that requires less effort rather than more or entails less downside risk rather than more or whatever, you know, those are all good things. Um, but I think kind of where it all nets out is, well, when you take account of all of those factors, which things just you know, seem like a good bet, right? And so just you know, to give a concrete example, Atlas, uh, the, the, the service we launched for helping uh, new founders in corporate companies, and in particular sort of uh, without the geographic restrictions that tended to exist before, so it's essentially open to founders anywhere in the world. Um, there was no kind of one reason as to why uh, that was a good bet. There was no kind of, you can't just measure that on any one axis, right? Um, but the kind of when you look at it overall and you see that, well, if it doesn't work, um, it's, it's hard to see how it could cause that much downside for Stripe. It's not going to require an enormous kind of fixed cost investment in order to sort of learn as to at least whether it's initially working. Um, if it did work, it seems like it could produce kind of quite significant returns. 
uh, the kinds of things we'll have to do for it are actually things that are probably valuable for us in other parts of the business and so on. So we'll, we'll learn interesting new capabilities and skills uh, in the course of doing it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think the reason there aren't more good bets made in the world is because making good bets is difficult. Uh, and again, I think you can have in, in different areas, um, Difficult in terms of recognizing them or difficult in terms of acting and executing on them? Or what do you mean by difficult? I think both. Um, well, I, th I think most organizations are sort of institutionally resistant to bets uh, in that because most people are necessarily optimizing things that already exist. Uh, and, and again, that's correct. We're not making a mistake. I mean, th things that are not optimized uh, uh, along the way, especially things that are not being kind of fixed and optimized and patched up and corrected as they burgeon, I mean, those are going to, to, to break, right? And so the optimization is critically important. I don't mean to sort of sound remotely kind of uh, dismissive towards it. Um, but, but bets have a very different character, right? Um, uh, and you know, this is sort of a continuum of betfulness and, and riskiness. Um, well, startups uh, are bets, yeah, no, right? Exactly, effectively. right. And, and large institutions and incumbent organizations uh, sort of dislike them, right? Stru structurally speaking, uh, and, and find them difficult to understand and difficult to interact with and so on. And I think there's a whole host of reasons there and that, you know, p people are in you know, startups are sort of less worried about the risk of failure, whereas people in sort of existing systems must worry quite a bit about the risk of failure, you know, newer things tend to operate on sort of um, on faster uh, sort of clock cycles. And so, you know, um, uh, uh, Dijkstra talked about the idea of the Buxton index and the uh, the sort of time horizon upon which an organization makes its decisions. And so maybe a university makes its decision, you know, its decisions uh, with sort of a decades long time horizon, whereas maybe a company makes decisions on sort of a quarterly time horizon. Uh, and maybe a, you know, maybe an individual makes decisions on a you know, weekly or monthly time horizon, whatever. Um, and uh, anyway, sort of the observation was that organizations with very different Buxton indices find it difficult to work together. <laughs> um, if an organization with a really long time horizon is working with one that's sort of rapidly uh, uh, updating and, and, and sort of uh, rethinking, um, th there's just like a fundamental kind of impedance mismatch. And so I think that you know, to, to your question as to sort of why, there, why it's hard and why there aren't more good ones in the world, I think there are lots of different kinds of impedance mismatch like that. It's not just the time horizon thing, but I think there's just like a fundamental deep intrinsic difference between sort of existing incumbent systems and the actions and the mindset required to optimize them and the sort of uh, the exploration of figuring out uh, uh, that which is totally orthogonal, different and, you know, uh, and new. How do you keep the mentality? I mean, when Stripe started, the cost of failure was really low. Now you have a thousand employees, they all have families, you have a business, you have people who have invested a lot of money in the business. How do you maintain that ability to place massive bets? Uh, it's really a question of uh, how do we make sure that we can place bets that don't have excessive downside <laughs> um, or, or sort of fatal downside, right? Uh, or, or maybe cumulatively fatal downside across maybe a whole portfolio of bets. Um, and I think that actually, um, I think the impediments to placing good, well, I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll caveat all this by saying it's not like Stripe has a long track record of sort of making really good you know, investment bet decisions. You know, we are, I am, we are far from being uh, the, the Apples or the Berkshires or whoever, you know, a multi-decadal uh, sort of track record of well, we're making good We're back here in bets. a decade. We'll, we'll reevaluate. <laughs> exactly. uh, if, if we are here in in. Uh, three decades, which you know, as established, uh, would would uh, will not be the default outcome. Um, uh, the, uh, and and we have a great portfolio of uh, successful such decisions. Then perhaps we can opine, you know, with with I don't know, some modicum of confidence. Um, but it feels to me, uh, and we'll we'll see if this is right or not. It feels to me that actually the reasons that organizations don't take don't tend to make more of these um, or make more good ones is. It's more kind of sociological, more institutional, and less that it's fundamentally too costly. Because in most cases, the downside cost is not that large. Uh, and either in terms of like just direct financial cost or in terms of the sort of the broader damage to the organization, whatever form that might take, it's much more the mindset of uh, improving that which already exists is just quite different to the mindset of 
screw the old system, uh, let's do something that's fundamentally new from scratch. Uh, and so I think the challenge is in significant part, how do you reconcile these two mindsets? Um, how do you have the, I mean, Stuart Brand um, talked about pace layering in buildings uh, and sort of different parts of the building has parts of the building have to change at different rates and how do you design for that? And I think the kind of analogous question for, for an organization is how do you do organizational pace layering? How do you have parts of the organization that can try to do something fundamentally different to uh, and hopefully superior to that which already exists? And how do you have people who are trying to, who, are, who basically disagree with people trying to do something new, who think that no, the way we're currently doing it is in fact the right way. We're just going to do it better and better. And because these people fundamentally structurally disagree with each other and must have significant conviction in their respective approaches, otherwise they do great work. How do you have those people at the end of the day have dinner together and fundamentally feel like they're on the same team? How do you do that? <laughs> Come back in 30 years. Um, I think I recall one of the interviews that I was watching as prep for this, where you talked about one of the um, first five or six people worked at Bridgewater. No, uh, one guy in particular did, and uh, over time we've hired more people who have. But yeah, we were, I would not say we were particularly Bridgewater influenced. Did you come at this sort of um, notion of thoughtful disagreement before that influence? And how, if so, how did you... Well, yeah, it, it's hard to know exactly where to attribute it. And it, it's probably kind of overdetermined. Um, and maybe they're just going to... Some sort of underlying personality traits that we each had sort of um, come to in sort of different parts of our lives in, in sort of somewhat coincidental ways. Um, I mean, for a start, to your earlier question, Irish people are always disagreeing and always arguing. Um, and so again, maybe there's a cultural dimension to it. Um, uh, it's, it's not a, um, it's not something that, that, that people tend to shy away from. Um, because they don't I, see it as an attack on them. Exactly, right, right. Um, I think that, I, I think there was just a common shared personality trait uh, in, in a lot of the people who helped establish the culture of Stripe where they enjoyed uh, sort of disagreement and trying to find the boundaries of an argument and the places where it's not the case and uh, and what the exceptions might be uh, and just trying to kind of get a feel for the topology of, of that space and kind of stumbling in the dark, try to construct a map of where different intuitions and heuristics apply and where they don't and so on. And, and like, I, I think one kind of deep mindset difference um, in people is often those who uh, those who enjoy finding the limitations of arguments and beliefs, and those who don't. <laughs> um, and Tyler Cohen talks about, uh, I think it's his uh, second law, um, that there are no knockdown arguments. Um, th there are no arguments that are just uniformly completely true. Uh, there's, there are always the limits to it. Uh, uh, th th there's always the other side. And I think that's kind of very deeply true, but I think there's kind of just a, a question of sort of affect and, and again, personality as to, do you enjoy finding those limits and the exceptions and thinking about, well, maybe this is less true than I think, or where is this less true than I think? Uh, or, or is that just like a stressful process? Uh, and I think that uh, sort of getting that kind of rigor and, and, and clarity of thought requires uh, sort of a, a joy of discovery, a, like, ah, this this thing I believe, this rule that I thought existed, like, it's actually not good in this place. Uh, and, and having that be an enjoyable discovery rather than sort of something stressful and, and you know, threatening. And what I think gl globalization is a good example there where, you know, as we discussed, I think that globalization um, is on net overall for the world a fantastic thing uh, and something that... You know, support is rising for a global basis and has propelled more people out of poverty than you know, almost any other force ever. Um, and yet there are people like you know, Danny Roderick and others who are sort of prodding at the edges of that and showing, well, but not in this place or not in this way or, or auteur and you know, these other folks at, at MIT, like maybe it has this 
sort of underappreciated downside. And I think that's great. As in, I, th I think those are important questions and, and really interesting work. Um, and I think that kind of, again, the underlying sort of sentiment is uh, sort of interest in where the heuristics and the intuitions and the rules and the arguments are wrong. I want to come back to some of that a little bit later. I think one of the questions that people want to hear from you is what what would you say is the biggest difference between the Patrick making decisions today and the Patrick making decisions maybe five years ago in terms of how you actually make those decisions? I think there are four big differences. The first is, I, and I just place more value on decision speed uh, in that uh, if you can make, like if you can make twice as many decisions at half the kind of um, half the precision, that's actually often better. Um, uh, and, and then given the fact that sort of the uh, rate of improvement of decision making with additional time almost necessarily tends to kind of flatten out, I think that most people, certainly the Patrick of five years ago, and potentially even the Patrick of today included, um, should be sort of earlier should be operating uh, earlier in that curve, make more decisions with less confidence, um, but in significantly less time, right? Uh, and just recognize that in most cases, you 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 can course correct and, and treat fast decisions as a kind of uh, asset and capability in their own right. Uh, and it's quite striking to me how some of the organizations that I hold in the highest regard uh, tend to do this. The second thing is... Um, not treating all decisions kind of uh, uniformly. Uh, I think the mo most obvious um, kind of axes to break them down on are degree of reversibility and magnitude. Uh, and things with low reversibility and you know, great impact and magnitude, uh, those ones you do want to you know, really deliberate over. Um, and, and, and try to get right. But I think it's very easy uh, sort of absent care to have maybe this mechanism you put in place for those decisions to seep into um, uh, decision making for the other categories. And really in the other three quadrants, you can afford to be sort of much more flexible and, and much more fluid. And, and again, really just to prioritize speed, because obviously if it's very reversible, then, you know, by definition, uh, you can always correct it later. Uh, and if it's, you know, of low import, then <laughs> who cares, right? Um, uh, and so that's kind of the second one, and just being kind of cognizant of that, and, and before making the decision, trying to categorize, well, what kind of decision is it? Uh, the third thing is uh, I now try to fairly deliberately just make fewer decisions uh, in that, why am I making the decision? Uh, and for some kinds of decisions, you know, there are some um, good reasons for that. I mean, there are some decisions the CEO ought to make and is kind of fundamentally on the hook for. But there are some decisions where if I'm making it or if I have to make it, that probably suggests that something else organizationally or institutionally has broken. Uh, and I think the need for a decision uh, from, from anyone, not just from me, is often like only a sort of um, an epiphenomenon. Uh, and there's really some other underlying issue that's causing you to have to make it in the first place. And so thinking about that, and concretely doing more to push others to make decisions um, uh, and, and sort of uh, pushing them back sort of t to people who ought to be the, the domain experts. And then fourth, when I realized that I would make a decision differently to how someone else is making it, uh, not even really discussing the decision itself, but trying to dig into what is the difference in our models such that you want to make decision A and I want to make decision B. And one thing we're currently spending a bunch of time on here at Stripe is having different parts of the organization write down what they're optimizing for, essentially, like what their mission is, what the long-term key metrics are for, for kind of their part of the organization, um, what who, who their customers are, either internally or externally, uh, and sort of things of this kind of persistent, on, ongoing, underlying nature, such that you know, hopefully once there's agreement on those longer-term things, then maybe a difference on um, on sort of any particular decision might just be well we differ sort of on what the most instrumentally effective way to achieve this outcome is, but we're sort of both really unified on what the desired end state is. And there, I think I think disagreement over sort of instrumental efficacy, you know, well, 
th that's really that problematic a disagreement because, well, if you're right, then we'll soon learn that. If you're wrong, reality will probably uh, sort of make that pretty clear in, in short order. I think the more troubling ones and the ones that tend to cause more kind of persistent friction uh, in an organization are where sort of there is latent disagreement in what you're actually optimizing for. Um, but that's kind of never explicitly surfaced and uncovered. And so now, I guess, again, in decision making, I, I, I place kind of more importance on making sure that we have the right sort of foundational agreement, such that the kinds of disagreement that then tend to arise are of the sort of essentially more superficial sort. Uh, and their agreement is actually less important. Part of culture is learning uh, from the decisions the organization makes? What do you do at Stripe to make sure that people are learning? And what do you do personally to make sure that you're learning from the decisions that you've made, both positive and perhaps ones that you, in retrospect, would have um, wished you could make differently? I'm inclined to say, I don't know if I actually believe this, but I'm inclined to say in response to that question that decision-making in organizations is slightly overrated <laughs> uh, in that organizations are not like investment entities um, or funds or, or managers uh, in that or organizations, well, well, with investing, it's fundamentally very binary. There is a moment uh, at which you either buy or, or, or don't or sell or don't or whatever. Um, and maybe it's somewhat more continuous in the case of, say, public market investing and so on. But given sort of um, <laughs> constraints on just decision-making time, I think you have to treat it as a bit more binary. You assess the stock and you make a buy or, 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 a, um, or not decision. Uh, whereas in organizations, everything is much more fluid and continuous. It's much more about, I think, designing the feedback mechanisms. You know, it's more the, biological. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's the famous um, uh, sort of... Um, water model uh, of the economy, <laughs> um, uh, you know, with the sort of uh, circulating fluids and you can vary the interest rate or the inflation rate or, or whatever, but just kind of try to get a sense for the overall kind of um, uh, biological apparatus. Uh, and I think an organization is much more like that. And so the, the I think the things, the things to optimize are the incentive structures and the mindsets and the definitions of the goals and the feedback mechanisms from the outcomes to the inputs and the work and the operations themselves and all of those things, and less the, the binary decisions. And I don't want to kind of completely um, dismiss, obviously, the importance of decision making in that there are times where you've decided, well, are we going to launch this product or not? Are we going to start this project or not? Are we going to replace this system or not? And so on. So there are, of course, real decisions, but I think it tends to be much more well, I guess maybe it doesn't feel like the right unit of analysis to me. Uh, I think the right unit of analysis is is that of the cell. Uh, and then the question is, well, in an organization, what are the cells uh, and what are the organs and, and how do they interact? What are the feedback mechanisms between them? Let's geek out a little bit on the, the feedback mechanisms here. What sort of feedback mechanisms do you try to make sure are in place? What point in the process, do you try to acknowledge what they are? I really think that, uh, and this is not to evade the question, but um, I really think it's too early to answer that. Uh, in the sense that, I mean, I, I can kind of tell you what I think today and the sort of changes we've made over the last year and things like that. But like Stripe has been a thousand person organization for, uh, or has been a, a more than 500 person organization uh, for just over a year, right? Um, we're, we're beginners at this. Uh, and, you know, three years ago, Stripe was under 100 people. Uh, and, and I think either to uh, opine as if, uh, or to even more problematically believe that we kind of have it figured out would be, would be real hubris. Um, and so kind of in what we've been talking about, I think that's maybe some of uh, you know, where our and my thinking comes from. But, but I don't know what the right answers are yet. Um, and, and we spend a lot of our time sort of scrutinizing other organizations, trying to find out and, and kind of reverse engineer what works for them and why. Um, and I think that part of what's interesting about the tech industry is that it's... It's a kind of pure knowledge work, 
that we're still, I think, quite early in sort of figuring out um, in, in terms of how to optimally coordinate it uh, and, and collaborate on it uh, in that you can sort of draw a lineage of HP and Intel and Microsoft and Google and Facebook and so on, WhatsApp. Um, and there are all these sort of suggestive examples that I think at least, again, suggest that we may not have it all figured out. I mean, th the fact that WhatsApp was such a minuscule team and Instagram too, of course, despite operating at such a scale, um, or the fact that the way of a new paradigm. Yeah, yeah. And the way kind of Facebook operates is very different to the way, you know, HP operated. Outside of Stripe, which company cultures do you admire the most? Not business models, but culture and why? Well, I admire cultures that are strong, first off. Cultures that when you ask somebody who's in the culture, can you describe it, um, that they will, uh, that they can expound on its merits for more than half an hour. Uh, and in almost every case, d describe at some length all the things they don't like about it, right? Um, because if it's strong, they're, I mean, it's improbable that every aspect of it is something that the person you know, really uh, agrees with or feels an affinity for. And so whether it's uh, the New Yorker or the military, <laughs> uh, a, a shared characteristic of those cultures is that they're strong. Right? So I think that's the first order thing. And I don't, I don't think that describes most organizational cultures. I think most organizational cultures are some kind of milk toast averaging, right? So that's number one. Um, the second is cultures of, of perfection. Um, and so both The Economist and Apple have extraordinarily high standards for themselves um, and, and really kind of in both cases, the work has a kind of primacy. And so who designed the latest iPhone or who wrote that article? In both cases, that's anonymous <laughs> uh, because there's such a belief that the work speaks for itself, right? Uh, and uh, I have a lot of admiration for that. Um, and then cultures that have longevity uh, and really sustained success. Uh, and so I think that um, uh, one of our major investors is Sequoia Capital. And Sequoia has been you know, the top firm or in the top three firms. You know, obviously, it's a subjective ranking, but call it you know, a top, unquestionably a top three firm for, uh, for essentially its entire existence. And there was no other VC firm that has been a top three firm for, you know, call it four decades. Uh, and so I think the obvious question is, like, well, why is that? What's different about Sequoia? There have been tons of VC firms. And, and lots of different firms have had, at any moment in time, a strong claim to being a top three firm. But wh wh what are the underlying institutional characteristics that enable the, the, that to be sustained? And of course, you know, this applies to some of the other organizations we mentioned, uh, like, say, The Economist or, or The New Yorker, uh, or even this is one that um, I've been trying to read more about of late, uh, Coke Industries, uh, in that, you know, Charles is, of course, or Charles and David are most famous for their political activities. But if you just look at the company, uh, that has kind of compounded from 20 million in annual revenue to now, according to public estimates, 100 billion. Um, over, you know, call it five decades. Uh, and there aren't that many organizations that have compounded like that for that long without there being kind of one driver of success. There's no one thing that enabled their rise. They didn't like stumble upon some resource that they kind of cornered. There was no kind of iPhone for them, et cetera. It's clearly something kind of deeper and more sort of institutional. Uh, and and the fact that that's been kind of sustained for so long, I think, is interesting in its own right. As in, what is it that uh, <laughs> Sequoia Capital, Coke Industries, and the New Yorker share? Uh, and I haven't quite unpacked the answer to that yet. Can you give us an example of what you've learned from studying Coke Industries? It's very striking to me how Warren and Charlie at Berkshire and how the folks at Coke Industries are so into a kind of epistemology and 
structuring of doubt and accounting for biases and mechanisms for for clarity of thinking, um, like to, to a very striking degree. I mean, obviously, if you read um, uh, the, the the public writings or you go to Omaha uh, and, and you listen to what you know Warren and and especially Charlie talk about. Um, you know, it, it's sort of half investing and half applied epistemology, half philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's been the case as well to a striking degree uh, with with Coke. Um, and I, I don't know them well enough by any means to sort of opine in any deep sense, right? Like I, I've never been to one of their factories. I, I've never looked at one of their financial statements. And so I, I'm not qualified to assess in any kind of comprehensive way. But just in terms of what it seems that the leadership prioritizes, it's strikingly consistent um, across two of the most successful multi-decadal institutions in, in, in the U.S. There's something to be said, going back to your point earlier, about learning from companies that have consistently demonstrated over a period of time without these huge kind of like one-off hits that have caused most of that track record. Right. You're a huge reader. Uh, where did this love of books get started? Well, we had crappy internet when I was growing up um, because our house was so remote. Um, there was so much noise on the phone line um, that we didn't have internet for years. And then we got it was treacle slow and so on. And, you know, I was, I was fortunate. My parents were very willing to pursue all these harebrained schemes. And so we eventually got an ISDN line, which was ferociously expensive. But God, that, um, you know, that, that was sort of the the uh, um, fiber of its day, at least as far as I was concerned, uh, 7.6K a second was, <laughs> was majestic. Um, I, I could barely keep up with the speed. Um, and uh, and then we eventually got a satellite uh, internet connection, which um, that was really a game changer. Um, but, but it effectively meant that for the first, I don't know, 14-ish, 15 years of my life, uh, there was no internet. And we lived in a very rural part of Ireland um, I was quite distant from even my friends at school. And so all that really was for us to do was to play in the garden, uh, which we did a lot of, um, and to read. Uh, and, you know, it's funny. I, I often wonder about this in the context of, you know, if I had kids or when I have kids, like, what's the optimal upbringing for them? And, of course, you think, well, you kind of want them to grow up in a stimulating environment and have all these, I don't know, experiences and extracurriculars and everything else. Um, but certainly that was not my upbringing. <laughs> uh, my upbringing was uh, a, a kind of... Get out of the house, go play. That, and, and I mean, there was plenty of stimulation around. You know, our parents had lots of books. And so, you know, we could just kind of burrow our way sort of sequentially through the shelves. Um, but, you know, it, it, was pretty, um, it was pretty unfettered. And I think our parents had a kind of... Uh, they followed our interests... Uh, and supported them, but they didn't choose them. <laughs> um, it felt like they um, they pushed from behind <laughs> um, rather than pulling uh, in front. Um, and and so anyway, I, I think that's where where the reading thing came from. And I think that um, well, I don't know. I, I I run quite a bit, and I don't even run because I enjoy it that much i mean i, I enjoy it um but it, uh, it's it's nothing kind of in the in the immediate moment it's it's not like it's euphoric or anything close to it i mean it's pretty painful um uh and you know there's the the greg lamont quote about uh, how i mean it's very dispiriting when you think about it and it is very deeply true that how uh, you, uh, how it never gets easier. You just go faster. That's true of running. Like if I stay running for the rest of my life, um, it will, it will never get easier. I will just go faster. Um, but just, it, it feels like something I ought to do. Um, it's, I, I vastly rather having run than not having run. Uh, and so I, I sort of continue to do it. Um, and with reading, Basically, I don't feel like I'm weird. I feel like everyone else is weird uh, in that there's just like so much stuff to know. And I guess I just feel stressed out by like it feels important or it's obviously important and I don't know it. And so shit, like I better you know, get to work. But it's not when I'm reading, I'm not in this like especially blissful place. I mean, it's I enjoy it perfectly fine. Um, 
but it's more like I, I um I think there are extremely important things that I really should know and and I don't, and that feels problematic. How do you filter what you read? Um there's millions of books. There's right. one of you. Right. Um hmm. Well, I discard a lot of books. I like the insight that uh, there's there's a set of um, there's a set of great books uh, that are really worth reading, right? And there's a subset of those books uh, that uh, that are really enjoyable to read. Maybe it's like ten or twenty percent of them, say. Um, and the subset, the intersection of really worth reading and really enjoyable to read, is actually still more books that you can read than you can read in a lifetime. Uh, and so uh, I you know, sort of decided, well, I will read all of the, um, the books that are really worth reading and really enjoyable to read. And then when I run out of those, then I'll go back to the books that are merely worth reading, right? And so, you know, fairly quickly, you can decide if this is an enjoyable book to read or not, and not discard it. And I think reading is like a, you know, should be treated as a, um, as a, as a kind of more active process, uh, sort of, you should, you should skim, you should skip, you should backtrack, uh, you should discard and then potentially return like the you know you are not subject to the book you're not a passive consumer like uh, the, the book is um the book is there for you you bought it it's yours um and like jump back and forward uh, tear it in half if you want annotate it wildly like you know use it um i wholeheartedly agree uh and and yeah i i maybe uh you know start half the books I get and I probably finish a third of the books I start. Um, and that works out to, uh, you know, finishing one to two books a week. Um, but, but if I finish it, that, you know, it's, I guess, it, well, it's probably been recommended um, by somebody in the first place. And then it looked interesting enough upon some very superficial skimming to start and then you know, if I finished it, it meant that it was quite interesting. So it's actually like a lot of selection that kind of happens along the way. And then I think just the other thing worth worth pointing out is, you know, there's the the line from Basho about the the, the Japanese poet um, that you shouldn't follow the people you most admire, but you should follow what they admired. <laughs> um, and and I try to do that. I try to figure out for the people who seem to be doing really great work or to have really interesting ideas or just who I admire in whatever regard, um, to figure out how do they get to who and what they are, uh, what influenced them, or, or what's upstream. Uh, and uh, and often it's quite obscure. Um, but I try to kind of disentangle that. When do you typically read? Always. Um, I mean, in the morning, in the evening, uh, while walking. While, while walking is a good one, actually. Uh, like, your, your peripheral vision is such that you can actually quite functionally read a book while walking. Um, and, and there's other people that strive to do this uh, and do it much more and faster than I do. Um, but uh, but you, just, you spend a lot of your time walking. And so uh, uh, being able to do that, um, I found to be uh, quite, um, quite valuable. Um, often while eating. Uh, <laughs> so so you're sitting at home on your couch yep. it's uh after dinner and yep. you pick up a book for the first time walk me through how you process that book what you look at yeah normally i'll jump sort of midway through it and just start reading and see like would i like to have ended up here and almost certainly like a bunch of the terms i won't recognize or the you know antecedent ideas i won't be familiar with or whatever but like do i yeah do, do I want to be here or had to have gotten here? Um, and if yeah, after a couple of pages, um, it seems like the answer is yes, uh, then I might sort of backtrack to the start and start kind of pursuing it a bit more seriously. Um, I mean, John uh, has this insight that, uh, and it's kind of related to the previous point, that um, at every moment you should be reading the best book you know of in the world. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't mean kind of the absolute best for everyone, but sort of the best book for you. <laughs> but like, as soon as you discover something that, um, that seems more interesting or more important or whatever, you, you should absolutely discard your current book, uh, sort of in favor of that. Um, because any other algorithm necessarily results in you reading kind of quote unquote, worst stuff over time. Suboptimal. Yeah, exactly. And so I'll be reading the book on the couch and then, you know, maybe after 50 pages, uh, I'll, I don't know, be in my room and I'll stumble across something else. Um, and uh, and I might just 
you know, switch rails. Uh, the other thing that I think is actually quite valuable is just leaving books out. Uh, and so when somebody recommends a book, I'll you know very often pick up a, a copy, ideally a used hardback copy, um, because the hardback books, you know, they're more durable. And now with Amazon, used hardbacks are really cheap. Uh, and I'll leave it out. And so there's books in the kitchen, there's books on, in my bedroom, and there's books you know, on my bed, um, and just strewn everywhere. And surprisingly commonly, either someone else will recommend the book or some aspect of the book, whatever, and it, it's still it's still salient, it's still around you. Um, uh, and you're like, oh yeah, I really should check out that thing. Uh, or something else triggers its relevance. You read an article, you just start appreciating a point or a question or something, right? And so I, 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 like, part of the reason that I still really value physical books is because uh, you, I mean, for now at least, uh, we still exist in physical space, and uh, <laughs> and it creates a kind of idea space for you uh, that makes kind of productive collisions more likely to happen. Uh, what types of things do you typically mark up in a book, and how do you? What does I, that look like? Um, so I tend to just make notes in the margin. Um, uh, so sorry, I tend to underline stuff, but in the margin, and I underline it. You know, misusing the term, I annotate it, mark it, highlight it uh, in the margin, because then you can flip through the book, just like quickly see the parts you marked, right? Um, and then the other thing is uh, on the last pages, uh, like kind of in the inside cover at the end, uh, I tend to very quickly note page numbers for particularly interesting points or um, things that jumped out or whatever, so that I, I can easily go back to a book and you know I have the list of the 30 things that I found most interesting. Um, so you keep the book, a book that you completely read, that you yep. like. Yep. How often do you come back to that book? Um, if I want to make a particular point or be reminded of a particular aspect or, you know, whatever, um, maybe I will. But, but generally speaking, I don't. And I think, you know, part of the value of making the annotations is, of course, to um, you know, imprint them more firmly in your mind so that you sort of don't need to come back <laughs> as much in some sense. If it's really good, I don't often do this, but if it's really good, um, I might write a review for friends uh, and just you know, share an email or a Google Doc or something, uh, or, or just share snippets with friends. Um, and that's valuable both because, again, sort of the act of, uh, of summary or summarization uh, sort of aids a kind of synthesis, uh, and, and, and better recollection. Um, but also, of course, uh, it triggers out pointers uh, and further suggestions uh, from, from those friends. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you want to um, identify candidates in adjacent, or, or, or if you want to perform the clustering and figure out what sort of adjacent candidates might be, you know, interesting for further exploration, uh, writing a review is, you know, uh, a good place to start. What sort of books have you written reviews on for friends this year? One that I really enjoyed um, was A Culture of Growth by John Mokir. Uh, sorry, sorry, Joel Mokir. Uh, apologies. Um, and it's, it's basically a book about why, why did the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, uh, really the Industrial Revolution, start when it did? And and where it did. And he basically makes the case, I mean, and there's obviously tons of different arguments that have been you know, made for this. Uh, and because it only happened once, it's sort of, we can never know definitively. And, you know, was it the abundance of, uh, or well, was it the abundance of coal in the UK? Was it the something about like the intellectual property system and patents? Was it the high cost of labor in the UK that sort of created more sort of, um, that made productivity enhancing improvements more valuable? Uh, was it something about trade, you know, and, and so on uh, and so forth. Um, and Mokir basically makes the argument that it was, um, that it was primarily intellectual and um, more than sort of quote unquote economic. Uh, and secondly, that it was sort of specifically a kind of synthesis of the importance placed in um, kind of scientific knowledge, where we kind of realize that scientific progress, knowledge about the world, uh, is 
exists and can be important and that progress is possible and that we're not just kind of um, imperfect, uh, I don't know, um, imitators um, or, or receivers of the knowledge of the ancients. Uh, and so kind of a belief in scientific progress um, coupled with a belief in sort of the practical importance of sort of, of of engineering and of the more prosaic aspects of of you know industry uh, and of of kind of practical pursuit and you know Mokir offers the example of Bacon, who both kind of uh, inspired the Royal Society, uh, it was kind of one of his followers who who created it, um, but also intended to catalog the practical knowledge of. Uh, all of the craftspeople in the UK and the kind of implicit functional knowledge that they had. And it's kind of this interesting combination of the sort of really high-minded and the very practical, right? And so kind of, I anyway, Mokir kind of teases through all these arguments and the kind of Republic of Letters and the sort of nascent you know, rise of, of, of science on the continent and so forth, but all in service of this question of why the Industrial Revolution then and there, and, you know, talks about d- versions of it uh, in uh, in China and so forth. Um, and uh, anyway, so, so I mean, I think it's a very important question and Mokir's kind of uh, discussion of it is, is, uh, is I thought, you know, pr- particularly interesting. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I summarized it for my friends. That's awesome. Which book or books would you say have most influenced you? So I asked this question on Twitter back um, a couple of weeks ago and some of the responses I got were really interesting. Um, and a lot of people responded. Um, like many more than I expected to. I, I didn't actually, embarrassingly, I, I feel guilty about this. I didn't post a response myself. Uh, and I thought about it, and it's actually just a very hard question to answer. Like, I actually worry that it may not, it may not have been a good question because, like, it's hard to know, did the book influence you or did you have an inkling or a leaning and then you read something that really resonated, but sort of it's, it's actually not... Like the the book is just the artifact up, upon which you project the sort of the characteristic that had already arisen uh, or the belief that had already arisen, um, and it's uh, the book is not actually causal in and of itself. Right now, maybe it's still interesting to talk about the book as a kind of symbol for the belief, um, but yeah, the, the, there's that kind of question, and then also. Um, uh, uh, what I've often found is I think the books that perhaps did in fact influence me the most in a causal sense are, are often not necessarily that good, right? Um, and that maybe I'll read a book that sort of triggers a realization or, or some idea or something and th- that will kind of jolt me in some direction. And then I'll go read better things about that question. And so it probably would have been better if I would just started with the better stuff. Um, but in some kind of truthful, descriptive sense, it's, it, 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 yeah, it was like the worst one that actually influenced me, right? Uh, and so, um, like, you know, maybe, maybe a better version of the question is, uh, like, which books do you wish you'd read sooner or something, right? Well, um, let's answer that question. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I don't think I can even answer that one now that I think about I can't it. I uh, this question. <laughs> this is your Yeah, comment. yeah, yeah. No, I, I hoist by my own petard. Um, uh, like it's also just sort of clusters of books uh, in that, you know, I think about programming, for example, like it would be hard for me to answer this question and not cite any programming books. I mean, it's been kind of so influential in at least my mindset in my life, but I can't really point to any single programming book. I, I can name 10 that I think in aggregate work together, like Paradigms of AI Programming by Norvig and Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs and you know, K and R C and um, uh, you know, books about operating systems, the Tannenbaum book, you know, et cetera. And in aggregate, those like hugely shaped me. Um, but I don't think I could single out just one. Um, um, e- even uh, uh, two books about PHP, um, which were written by a guy who now works at Stripe. I mean, well, one of those books is the book that taught me to program. And so, you know, in answering this question, I could hardly not cite those, right? Um, uh, but it's but it's kind of really the cluster. Um, or And, you know, you give a similar cluster about science or about economics or or, um, or sociology or you know, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, may, may I'll have to just get back with a better version of the question. Switching gears a little bit, what's the um, smallest habit that you have that makes the biggest difference? 
I reach out to people whose work I admire and tell them that, uh, and often it leads to a dialogue. And and in some cases, I've gotten to know them pretty well. Um, and so I'm fortunate that Tyler Cohen, who I mentioned, you know, is, is a friend, but I was never introduced to him. I just randomly emailed him years ago. I actually invited him to a Bitcoin meetup that I held in 2011. Uh, and I did not, however, buy any Bitcoin. But um, uh, I invited him to that meetup and he replied and you know, apologized that he couldn't make it. Um, but we sort of ended up in, in kind of a, a dialogue after that. Um, and you know, when you reach out to these people, yeah, half the time they don't respond. Um, but you know, half the time they do. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's asymmetric. <laughs> it doesn't really cost you much when they don't. And, and it can be incredibly rewarding when they do. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, if I did not do that, um, I would have missed out on a huge amount. How would you answer a question about what your personal values are? Probably by evading it. Uh, I'm now about to. Do you think perhaps that's... this disproved that answer um, <laughs> um, by actually answering it? But I, I guess I just think it's so. It, it feels like too important a question. It's a kind of like the book question. It feels like too important a question to answer simplistically, <laughs> uh, and or, well, and too complicated a question to answer briefly, uh, and thereby perhaps unsuited to something you know, extemporaneous. Um, and I'm sure whatever answer I gave, you know, when I'm thinking about it in an hour's time, I'll kick myself and realize I left out, you know, this critically important dimension to it. I mean, I think I. So I can I can cite some things I value, but the the sort of the, the sense of giving a complete answer is very oppressive. Uh, I mean, this is of course the value of Twitter, uh, where because of the constraint, um, the, the, there isn't the same uh, because because the system chooses when to cut you off rather than you choosing when to stop. Uh, that, that that that's quite liberating. Uh, and so maybe if you allowed me twenty seconds to speak about values, I could do that. Um, but I, I I could blame the constraint on anything I omitted. <laughs> We have 10 hours of recording left. <laughs> okay. Um, what would you say is the most common mistake that you see people make over and over again that you wish you could correct? And you have 140 characters. <laughs> um, maybe not having the right peer group or not having the right um, mentors isn't quite the right term because mentor implies something kind of quite active, but not striving to be more like the quote unquote right people or not just being kind of, in either case, deliberate enough about that. Uh, of course, who the right peer group is for you is, I mean, that's an entirely kind of personal and subjective question, but whoever it is, uh, is going to be massively formative and influential in determining where it is that you end up. I mean, Drew Houston has the quote about how um, you end up the average of your five closest friends. I think there's a very deep truth to that, right? But if you accept that, then of course, who your five closest friends are, I mean, cho choosing that, and we do, though we may not think of it this way, we do choose those people. Um, like you are choosing who you are. <laughs> uh, and of course, that's a kind of uh, sort of um, bi-directional process where who you want to be is determined by who you're around, which determines who you want to be around, and so on. Um, but people that will accept you. As <laughs> exactly, right, right. Um, but I think, like, certainly my mental model when I was 18 is that my five closest friends are, you know, people I ran into who kind of like me and I like them. And there's a kind of, you know, we're cordial and close and all those things, but that it's kind of fundamentally mediated by sort of happenstance. Uh, and I think people should kind of invest more in it uh, than, they, than they do. And, and related, once you've found those people, you should really invest in it. Um, uh, because if you accept they can shape you and you think they're the right people to shape you, well, then embrace that shaping, right? Um, and then kind of on the, on the mentor point or on the latter one, you know, I think almost all of us, at least subconsciously, have a set of people we hold in really high regard or would like to be more like in at least some ways and so on. Um, I see people, well, in my opinion, um, they've kind of, uh, 
they haven't either found the right people or just like the right relationships and so on. And if they had someone who was um, steering them more uh, or in better ways, could just be much better off. I want to talk a little bit about the future of e-commerce and maybe Silicon Valley culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I know we've got to end soon, but talk to me about how payments, you foresee them changing from not only the customer perspective, but from the merchant perspective um, over the next, you know. Well, I think there's two levels to this maybe um, in that there's, there's all just like the basic mechanical stuff about payments um, uh, where we kind of forget just how much friction still exists and how many business models and transactions and businesses and everything are, sort of are impeded for fundamentally kind of stupid reasons, right? Uh, in that because microtransactions aren't possible, both because the fixed costs are too high and because just like the friction's too high, then things that you know w- one would pay for with mic- microtransactions just don't exist, right? It's not that they pursue a different monetization model. In some cases they might, but as a general matter, a significant, num- significant number of them just won't exist, right? Or because maybe, um, it's hard to um, purchase things that are really expensive in a way where the kind of risk of fraud is sufficiently low, then you know you don't pay your rent online, say, right? Um, and so, uh, and then I think maybe the most important dimension to that is uh, the sort of geographic kind of um, uh, balkanization and sort of inefficiency that ensues where it's, extraordinarily difficult for somebody in Brazil to buy from somebody in Germany or somebody in Germany from somebody in India, et cetera, et cetera. And so you get this kind of unnatural sort of subclusters existing, not not because of sort of, you know, deep necessary limitations, but because of something much more arbitrary and contingent. And, you know, economists talk about sort of the gravity equation and the fact that the sort of proclivity of any two countries to trade falls off with the square of their distance. And, you know, there's all these like big questions about like, well, is that about something kind of fundamental in culture or about, um, uh, I don't know, just surprising returns to proximity or, you know, what have you. Um, and assuredly, there's, you know, some of that stuff. Um, but I think talking about the challenges and kind of complexities and hidden costs of payment methods, that doesn't feel like a very deep thing. It doesn't feel like something that is kind of significant enough on some level to have such kind of far-reaching and deep consequences. But I think a lot of these sort of ostensibly, um, quote-unquote, cosmic phenomena uh, are actually consequences of these very prosaic um, and um, straightforward limitations. And so I really think that solving this aspect of commerce and the internet, like literally just making it easy for any two parties, uh, a business and a consumer in arbitrarily chosen countries, making it easy for those two entities to transact will have enormous consequence for the world. And like that, that sounds like such a, a sort of a straightforward idea that it, it almost sounds cliched. And the fact that it sounds cliched should not blind us to the fact that it is still extraordinarily far from being the case today, right? Um, we have had commerce on the internet for decades at this point, but it's still like 90 plus percent of Brazilian credit cards do not work online outside of Brazil. Brazil is you know, not some backwater. It's not some inconsequential country, right? Obviously, one of the uh, top economies in the whole world. And Brazilian consumers basically cannot purchase outside of Brazil. Uh, and so it's difficult to overstate the magnitude of, of the sort of limitations and inefficiencies that prevail today. Um, so that's kind of the, the kind of payments level. And then kind of on top of that, I think there's, or beneath it, depending on how you look at it, um, there's maybe just like a deeper question of what determines how many firms there are in the world? And what determines the character of those firms? Are they doing something innovative and novel? Are they doing something pr- prosaic that has existed for a long time? Uh, what determines who starts uh, and why and the probability of survival? What determines the growth trajectory um, and the expansion rates into other markets and other products and so on? And I think part of the Stripe hypothesis is that things like that that seem very uh, sort of, one would think are are very difficult to move, (laughs) um, are actually movable. Um, And that, 
yeah, and, and really macro measures, like the number of people who start a company or who start a technology company, or again, the, the success rate of those companies. And you know, just to give some kind of um, illustrative, maybe um, intuition pumps here, uh, when we survey companies started with Atlas, 60% of them tell us they would not exist uh, if not for Atlas. And, you know, they could be wrong. Like maybe, maybe some of them actually secretly would. <laughs> but, maybe, but maybe some of them are actually overstating their own resourcefulness or overstating, maybe, maybe they're underestimating the challenges they would have faced. And so I, I think that number could either be too high or it could be too low, right? But, but let's be conservative and say that it's actually only 40%. If, if Atlas is causing you know, 40% of those founders to, to you know, start companies where they otherwise would not have, and if the kind of subsequent you know, success rates look similar, that's a huge deal, especially if Atlas itself gets big, right? Um, I mean, over time, that kind of real economic significance. Or you know, if we can make it um, the case that businesses sell to twice as many global markets as they would otherwise sell to. I mean, again, integrated over an entire portfolio, that's a really big deal. Or uh, Nick Bloom at Stanford uh, did this really interesting work, uh, has done a whole bunch of interesting work about management practices. Do management practices matter? Um, you know, is, it, is good management merely correlated or in fact causal in, in terms of um, uh, leading to or the, the, the advent of better outcomes? Um, and they did an RCT, a proper trial in India, uh, where they taught better management practices to a cohort of firms and did not to a sort of control group and saw double digit percentages in revenue over a multi-year period. Uh, I don't recall exactly. I think it was 13% over three years or something like that, right? Um, like that, that's an incredible low hanging fruit. Like all they did is, is teach better management practices, 13% uh, uh, more revenue, like 13% more value provided by the company as assessed by their customers, <laughs> um, just from better management practices. Um, and so, you know, when we think about Stripe and what to do in the future and the possibilities that exist and so on, it's much more, I think, about sort of how do we perturb this overall system to move some of these kind of macro outcome measures, like number of technology firms started survival rate of these companies, expansion rate of these companies, magnitude of the value provided to the end users, consumers, customers, and so on, and kind of mediated by payments as this kind of foundational layer because it's something every business necessarily has and because it uh, gives us good sort of understanding of the dynamics within the business and so on. But it's on some kind of fundamental level not about the payment even though we think that, kind of per the first point, the impact of just solving the payments will itself be enormous. Do you think reducing friction across the board is a good thing, or do you think friction in certain parts of it actually serves the system? Well, serves it for who? Well, th that's a good question. I mean, yeah. oh yeah, sure. I mean, look, I, I think across society, I think so many of the things that look like bugs are actually features from the perspective of um, uh, of of somebody of. of some constituency, right? And of course, so much of politics is you know, re reconciliation of the countervailing interests of different constituencies. And of course, you know, the problem is that in so many cases, uh, the incremental gain of the constituency is substantially outweighed by the social utility loss of the rest of society, right? Uh, and so you know, bad teachers um, do great in the US, um, but almost certainly that's kind of a, a net bad trade for society. But the bad teachers care more about uh, sort of uh, their ongoing employment uh, than the, the rest of society cares, evidently, um, uh, about correcting that. And you know the same thing applies to fishing policy, where uh, uh, Your perspective makes all the difference. Well, or, or but 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 uh, you know people driving fishing stocks to extinction care mo care more about their ongoing you know right to do so than the rest of society cares about um, about sustainable ecosystems. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's just. That's the character of political economy. Um, uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, to, to return to our earlier example, um, it's, it's not even clear that the, right, the, well, one, one could look at the fact that essentially no new banking charters are being issued in, in the US um, as a bug, uh, or of course, 
depending on your perspective, it's a wonderful feature. It's great for the regulators and it's great for the banks. Profits of consumer banks are higher than they've ever been. Until they all get wiped out in the next crisis, right? Um, and, and then because they're even more systemically important than they were in the past, they'll be to, to, to the extent there was a systemic argument for building them out in, in, in 08, there'll presumably be an even stronger argument in, in the future. It's almost like we were talking about this earlier, but bets, when you get big, you, you have more loss aversion. Uh, and so your goal is not necessarily to get better from your customer's perspective. It could be to prevent competition, um, prevent new entrants. That might be a more, um, without a moral judgment on it, it might actually be a more effective business strategy. Oh, for sure. Uh, than innovating for your... No, 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 no question. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that... <laughs> um, I, I think we're very sort of dissonant on this point as a society, where on the one hand we decry lack of innovation, on the other hand, in our collective action, we do so much to ensure that it doesn't occur, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, on the one hand, we decry the state of the sort of um, medical industrial complex and the 18 and a half percent of our GDP that is spent on healthcare costs and uh, the plateau or even decline in life expectancy and the declining rate of drug discovery and so on. And yet, on the other hand, we sort of, uh, through regulatory structures, make it harder and harder to engage in drug discovery uh, or to, I mean, you, you can't even start a hospital uh, uh, unless you get a, uh, a certificate of need. But but if you, if you observe that, well, hey, you know, medical care in San Francisco doesn't seem so great and it seems extraordinarily expensive, you know, even though it seems like a very thankless undertaking, I'm going to try to do better. Well, first, you'd better get approval for that. Um, uh, you, can't, you can't just enter the market. And so I, I think that kind of, and I'm not making kind of a normative judgment. I mean, I have my personal preferences, but I'm not casting normative judgment as to kind of what we ought to do as a society. But, uh, the, the, the thing that I feel strongly is that we <laughs> were inconsistent um, uh, in our stated desires. There's like a perpetual sort of seesaw, if you will, where success sows the seeds of its own destructions. Would you, how would you make an argument right now that San Francisco or Silicon Valley is doing that? Oh, I mean, the obvious one. Well, the two obvious ones, I guess, um, are, are in culture and in housing um, and cost in general. I mean, on the latter, well, on cost, on the latter, everything is getting more expensive. Um, and... <laughs> and nobody seems to quite understand exactly what's going on, right? Uh, in, in that is this. Um, I mean, if you if you take healthcare again, for example, I mean the case has been made that this is not in fact uh, a bad thing. That what would you expect an enlightened society that has solved all of its other material needs to spend its money on? But healthcare, it's kind of it's it's the last thing. It's the last frontier. Um, and perhaps we are actually getting sort of commensurate improvements uh, if you sort of disaggregate appropriately and. You know, analyze the right way, um, you know, or perhaps not, right? Um, how much of this is some kind of Baumol cost disease where some things are getting more efficient and that higher productivity and higher wages um, uh, are sort of causing cost increases elsewhere to pay for opportunity costs and, and all the rest. Um, but I think sort of specifically in, in, in Silicon Valley, um, and, and you know specifically on cost of living and and housing, you know, Silicon Valley is the sort of greatest concentration of wealth creation uh, that I think has ever existed in the U.S. on a per square mile basis, potentially that has existed ever in the world. Right? Um, Facebook, Google, Apple, Intel. Um, you know they're all based in a um, you know a fairly small number of square miles. Right? Uh, and and if you sort of if you were to um, look at sort of Seattle and uh, and the Bay Area kind of together, right, uh, and look at the kind of that aggregate urban zone, you know, 
separated as they are by a two and a half hour flight, then of course you can layer in Amazon and and, uh, and Microsoft as well. Um, and obviously what you see is that their, their rise in success was enabled in part by uh, cheap mobility and cheap expansion. Um, and again, sort of through just sort of political economy and um, or collective decision making, that no longer exists. Cheap mobility no longer exists and, and cheap expansion. Uh, and, and you can see it now in the sort of latest generation of upstarts, you know, be it Twitter or Uber or Airbnb or Lyft or whatever, who are you know, facing the, these really significant kind of you know, structural headwinds. Uh, and, and so much of the wealth that's being created, this improbable fountain of, of, of wealth creation is accruing to the sort of lottery winners of the existing landowners rather than to the people who are actually doing the work. Um, and because of that accrual, the sort of the barrier to entry um, for, uh, for newcomers is getting progressively higher and you see it in declining rates of mobility. And furthermore, the other people in the city, not in the tech industry who might otherwise benefit from it are of course uh, uh, getting priced out. And you know, this is not necessary. I mean, you can look at places like, um, you know, obviously Tokyo has um, over the last couple of decades been an, an improbable, well, not especially improbable, but has been such an enormous economic success story. And you know, you had the boom and the bust uh, uh, of, and, the, and the supposed stagnation of Japan uh, in the kind of early 90s on, but sort of broadly speaking has done really well. But because of vastly fewer limitations uh, on, on, on housing supply, have had just very stable housing costs, have not had the same displacement, right? And so the, the kind of the issues we face and we see here in San Francisco where it's getting ever, you know, 40% rise since we got to San Francisco in 2010. That's not necessary. It's not natural. And, and it's it's a it's a function of our sort of collective decisions rather than kind of some um, some secular and unavoidable uh, uh, economic force. Um, and I guess I, I find it sort of uh, dispiriting because it's, uh, it's a negative sum in the sense that it's not just that these gains go to... Uh, go to these sort of existing uh, landowners, but actually there'll be fewer future gains. Like, I think you should be mad about this, you know, if you don't live in Silicon Valley and you don't have the slightest interest in doing so, because it's much less likely the next cool technology that you'd like to take advantage of will exist. Um, it, it, it's sort of, it's a, it's a suffocation um, of, of future potential and of future gains. Uh, and there aren't many places, well, if you believe in increasing returns to scale, uh, that sort of, um, you know, this is kind of um, Paul Romer's work and um, uh, and others um, that because of the sort of uh, the collision of ideas and people in cities makes them more productive uh, than than if they were elsewhere. If you believe that to be the case, and there's like pretty good empirical data that it is, then it, it you you can't just move elsewhere. You can't um, you, you can't just move to Nevada. Um, uh, or or wherever the south, uh, you, you actually will be less productive in those zones. And so again, I think it's a real loss in terms of spillover gains to the rest of society. Um, you know, in service of not building six-story buildings in San Francisco. What do you think your role as a large employer and thoughtful citizen of San Francisco is in in this? Well, I don't make any secret of the uh, the injustice and well the the moral injustice in terms of the displacement that's occurring um, and the sort of economic wrongheadedness of the prevailing policies um, and you know I'm a landowner in San Francisco John and I own a house together and I hope its value declines um, in that I think it's impossible to answer uh, what the price of land should be. Um, but I think it is very clear that on a marginal basis, the social returns of cheaper land in the most production, productive region of the country uh, would vastly outweigh the reduction in wealth you know, to, to existing landowners. Um, 
But going back to the and, banks, everybody and, has a system that they want to protect. That's totally right, right. I mean, of course, you can try to estimate the magnitude here. And so over at Berkeley, this guy, um, Enrico Moretti, has estimated that 50% of uh, U.S. GDP growth between 1964 and, I think, 2010 um, uh, was left on the table, as it were, by sort of inefficient land use and uh, and, and land allocation. Um, and obviously 50% of the high number and quite speculative, and it's very difficult to measure the counterfactual. But even just the idea that one can with a straight face hypothesize that it could be anything remotely in that vicinity, I think gives you a sense for uh, how high the stakes here are, right? Uh, and yes, we, we, we can decide that, um, uh, you know, we place such an enormous premium on the aesthetic appearance of the San Francisco of today, recognizing that it is of approximately a third of the density of even just Greenwich Village in New York, right? We're, yeah. we're, we're not, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the other extreme is not Hong Kong. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. You, 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 you can triple San Francisco and get to Greenwich. Um, uh, we can decide that that's our preference, um, but sort of, you know, sober estimates uh, are, are measuring the cost of that in uh, in you know, double digit percentage points of aggregate you know, national GDP, uh, and of course, when you look at uh, our revealed preferences in terms of where we like to take vacations to, or where you know we dream of I don't know spending a summer someday and things like that, it's to to, to, to European cities, um, uh, which tend to be of uh, of very significantly higher density. Paris, London, much much higher density than San Francisco, and so. Um, Again, uh, I, I'm hesitant to cast normative judgment, um, but I personally feel strongly. I think that's a great place to leave this. Uh, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people find uh, more about you? Well, if they want to start a business, they should have to com. But um, if they want to uh, subject themselves to more of the particular detritus that I post, um, uh, they can head to uh, my Twitter account, which is just Patrick C. Thank you so much. Thank you.